is Pastor Lauder Milton from the Cross Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about our services and our service time and invite you to come and worship with us. We have many wonderful programs in place that would be a blessing to your family, our children's program, our teenage program, and, and the Bible studies and the church services that are geared for each member of your family. Way of the Cross Church is located at 612 Beatrice Drive in Riverside, Ohio. Riverside is a small community between Dayton and Huber Heights. Beatrice Drive is a connector street between Brant Pike and Harshman Road. The church is located again at 612 Beatrice Drive. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., of course, our main service. We have service on Sunday evening at 6.30 and then our midweek Bible study for adults and teenagers and children of all ages is on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I sincerely invite you to come and be part of these services, and God bless you as uh, you watch the program this evening. Now, I'll just take a few moments of your time. Uh, obviously, when we use the phrase church on fire, we're using a metaphorical phrase. Um, a metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. In a modern sense, in a modern literal sense, it would be a bad thing for the church to be on fire. We, we'd be calling for the fire department, would we not? Uh, so obviously when we call for a church on fire Sunday, we mean something much, much more significant, much more important. And the Bible helps us to understand what that is. Actually, the metaphor of fire is used very frequently in the Bible as to an extreme unction of the Holy Spirit, as to, a, as to an overwhelming presence. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, our God is a consuming fire. You remember over in the book of Exodus, Moses, he said he saw a bush that burned and it was not consumed. And, and he said, I'm going to turn aside and see this fire where this bush is burning, but yet it's not burned up. And God says to him, take your shoes off, boy, you're on holy ground. Amen. So fire is a very common way of describing the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, I indeed baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I, this is what John said, he who is mightier than I is coming. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and what? And fire. Amen. Amen. In Psalms 104 verse 4, it says, He makes his angels spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. Amen. So, you know, you're all ministers. We're all ministers. You understand that, don't you? I'm not the only minister in this house. You understand that? Yeah, I'm a teacher. That's my spiritual gift. But you're ever one ministers. Amen. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's your job to go and minister. Amen. Amen. So he makes his ministers a flame of fire. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9. Jeremiah was going through a discouraging time in his life. He was preaching. Nobody was listening. I've been there a time or two myself. <laughs> he said, if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back. You know, if you get this inside of you, it's got to come out. Amen? Amen. Amen. In 2 Chronicles 7:1, as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering, and the sacrifice of the glory of the Lord filled the temple. That was at the dedication of the temple of Solomon. Do you understand that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and you know, the sacrifice that we offer to God, we don't offer a sacrifice for our sin. The sacrifice for our sin has been wholly consumed. What we offer to God is a sacrifice of praise. Amen? And if we'll praise God, if the praises will go up, you know what will happen? The fire will come down. Amen. 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 So, now there are many other uh, metaphorical references to this, this uh, idea of fire in the Bible. And I'm going to 
take the time this morning to, to uh, uh, do any more, I don't think. But um, I hope that just those few comments have helped you to think about this concept of being on fire. That to be on fire is to be not just excited, not just have a, a, a blowout of a service, although I enjoy a blowout service. I, and, you know, I, might, I probably should explain that, that term, too, you know. You know, a service where just, you know, just the, the glory of God comes down and kisses the earth and you get caught in the smack in the middle. You know, anybody likes that kind of, a, of, of arrangement. But the fire of the Lord is more than just an interruption into your humdrum life. The fire of the Lord will give you the strength to run this race. The fire of the Lord will help you to be able to sing when you're in prison and it's midnight. You know, the fire of the Lord will warm you when you feel your heart is cold, but the fire of the Lord. So I want you to know something about the fire of the Lord. So let me, for, for, for the sake of time, now I was going to talk to you about, you know, how that the church belongs to Jesus and he loves the church no matter what state it's in. You know, he loves the, he loves the uh, church that's lost its first love. He loves it, and he wants to stir up the church that's lost its first love. He loves the church that's cold and dead and have, have drifted off into orthodoxy, and, and they're going through the motions rather than in the, the, you know, the love affair. He, he, loves, he even loves the church that's lukewarm. He says, I don't want you to be lukewarm. He said, I can't stand you if you're lukewarm. But he said, if you'll, if you'll repent and you'll, You'll let me. He said, I'll put eye salve on your eyes and where you were blind, you can see. He said, I'll, I'll renew the fire of devotion in your life because God loves his church. Amen? Amen? What's church made up of? Made up of Christians, isn't it? Yeah. That's what, church is made up of Christians. So when I talk about a church on fire, I'm really talking about a Christian being on fire. How many of you would like to have, just be on, more on fire for the Lord? I, I, you, some of you, are, you're afraid to say anything, you know. How many, really, if you think about it, now I'm just asking you, how many of you would really like to just have the joy of the Lord back in your life like you know you could have? Amen. Should have. Would have. Amen. All right. Well, let me just give you these thoughts today. They'll be brief. I might give you a few more next Sunday. But next Sunday is Communion Sunday. I'm, I'm looking forward. To, listen, listen, a church that's on fire is a reverent church. Do you know that? Yeah, a church that's on fire is a respectful church. You know that? They respect each other's worship. You know, one of the most um, disturbing things for me as a pastor, when I see people not being reverent or respectful in the house of God. Now, 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 now wait a minute. Now, that sounded like I was going negative on you. I'm not going negative on you. I'm just telling you that the church of Jesus Christ you know, God wants to set your heart on fire. But there's something, you have to, you can, listen, listen. Without wood on the fire, the fire goes out. And if you get your wood wet, the fire will go out. I want to dry your wood out. And I want to help you to have the fire come down on your sacrifice. Amen? Amen. All right, so let me just give you these thoughts real quick. The number one, a church on fire is a singing church. Did you know that? A church on fire. You can't be on fire without singing. You cannot. You cannot be on fire with, listen, it's good as a singing Christian, it's good to let God put a new song in your mouth and sing it everywhere you go. Sometimes I go shopping and they're playing that musical soundtrack and I don't, you know, I can't understand half what they're saying anyway, so I just make up my own words and I, I sing right along with whoever's singing, but I'm singing to the Lord. Amen. God will put a song, if you'll let him, God will. And, and you know, before you can sing, you've got to open mouth and sing. Amen. I'm standing up here sometimes. I, sometimes I feel, I, you know, I think I, worship team leaders, worship leaders, they really ought to be commended because, you know, it's their job to raise the dead sometimes, you know? And sometimes, I, sometimes we come, all of us, all of us, we come kind of, you know, just kind of just drifting in, dragging in, you know, and, and we're just, we need something, and we're waiting for somebody to plug in and help us. You know? But what if we entered his presence with thanksgiving? What if we come before his presence with singing? What if you got out of your car singing on Sunday morning? Love lifted me. 
What if you got out of your car singing, I'm feeling better? So, is that a good point or not? I gotta, I, I'll start hollering at, hollering at you if I'm not careful now, so I've got to be careful. <laughs> a church on fire. It's a singing church. I want to just, I want to give you the scripture for that. Second Chronicles, are, you, are, you, are we okay, Debbie? Second Chronicles 5, I'm going to depend on you, Debbie. I'm not going to use my Bible. I'm going to, I'm going to read off the, off the screen this morning. Second Chronicles 5, 11 through 14. I'll just do this real quickly. Second Chronicles 5. 11 through, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Hermon and Jephthah, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters, the trumpeters and singers, what? <laughs> when the musicians and the singers were as one to make, to make one sound to be heard in what? Praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the, with the trumpets or the keyboard or the drums or the organ, or the cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, What? What? For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Ah, uh, that the house of the Lord was what? Filled with a cloud. <laughs> what kind of cloud? The glory cloud. The glory cloud. The glory cloud. I can't help but believe if the church of Jesus Christ would begin to praise God with abandonment and with joy and with thanksgiving and would really enter into his courts with praise and come before his presence of singing, I can't help but believe that the glory cloud would fill the house. Now, I want you all to wear something red next Sunday to, to express a little bit of solidarity. But the real way to get the fire burning is to start singing unto the Lord a new song. Amen? Start giving the Lord some praise. Start singing to the Lord. Just sing unto him and lift up his name. Now, I stood up here this morning. Now, I, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be judgmental or anything. You know, I'm not judgmental. I'm just analytical. <laughs> I look back to you there. And, and, and a bunch of you were just standing there like, I'm a fence post. <laughs> I'm here, I'm just, I'm a fence post. I'm standing here, I'm just standing here. They told me to stand up, so I'm standing up. <laughs> Do you know the reason you stand, the reason you stand, now listen, if you're just standing up because somebody told you to stand up, I, I, that's respectful on your part, and, and I, that's appreciated. But the reason you stand is because somebody more important you is in the room. When I was in the army, I found this out quick. I found this out quick. When somebody wearing a bar, or two bars, or a bird, when they walked into the room, buddy, we all stood up. Glory to God. I stand because I stand in honor of the high and holy lifted up one. Praise God. Woo! Boy, I tell you what, I felt that. Man, praise God. So it's a singing church. Now I have all these scriptures about a singing church, but I won't get done if I do them all. So I'm just going to tell you that there's a bunch of them. <laughs> the first time I found it is over in Exodus chapter 15. You know, Miriam, she, she started singing. She said, we will, we will sing unto the Lord because the horse and the rider has been cast into the sea. And she was talking about Pharaoh. But in Revelation, if you're in Pastor David's Revelation class, you'll find out there's another horse and rider that's going to get cast into the sea too. Glory to God. I am going to stand up and rejoice and praise God and sing unto him because Satan is going to be cast underneath my feet. Glory to God. And I'm crossing over this Red Sea. Amen. I'm going into Canaan. Glory to God. Amen. All right. All right. Well, like I said, there's too many, there's just a lot of verses there, and you could look for them all. But you remember that one over in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas, but how justly accused 
put in prison, not just put in prison, but put at the back of the prison. Not just put at the back of the prison, but put in stocks and chains in the prison. And what happened? What did you do? What did you do? Well, they all, you know, you know what happened. They're like everybody else. They thought, oh, God, we must not supposed to have been here. Oh, Lord, you've left us for sure and certain. We're hundreds of miles. We're 500 miles away from home. Oh, Lord, we're a long ways from home, and we're here, we're in prison. And that was it. That was the end of the story, right? That was the end of the story, right? What was the story? At midnight, what? At the darkest hour of the night, what? They begin to sing and praise God. And what happened? What happened? The prisoners heard them. Don't you know there's somebody that needs to know the song, same song you're singing or could sing or would sing? <laughs> somebody else needs to hear that song. That's why it's important. There's a Christian, you sing unto the Lord <laughs> with all of your heart, not just in church. Not just in church, but wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. <laughs> I did read on Facebook this morning, you shouldn't sing in the shower. See, because if you sing in the shower, you might get to dancing. And if you get to dancing, if you get to dancing, you might fall. And then the emergency squad will see you naked. Listen, a church on fire is a singing church. Practice it, girls and boys. Practice it. Practice it. I, 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 listen, now there's one or two of you, there's one or two of you, if, if you got defensive about it, you could say, well, I'm older than you, Pastor Bill. But not many of you could say that. Not many of you. Not many of you could say, and, and, and I'm looking around this room, I don't think there's anybody in this room who can say, well, Pastor Bill, I've been preaching longer than you. I don't think you could. Listen, as long as I'm able to dance a little before the Lord and praise a little before the Lord, you are too. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> praise Him. But don't just praise Him in church. Don't just praise Him in church. Praise Him in the hospital corridor. Praise Him when it's tough. You'll get through it. God will help you. And Jesus said in this world, you, you'll have some tough times. But that's the time to praise him. That's the time to sing. So it's a singing church. A church on fire is a singing church. A church on fire, I'll just go through, uh, I'll go, quick, go through this quickly. A church on fire is a seeking church. You see, let me give you some scripture. I love them that love me and those who seek me early shall find me. Listen to this one. Isaiah said this, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He said, seek, knock, and ask. Amen? See, because a church on fire is a seeking church. This is what the psalmist said in Psalms 34.10. They that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And again, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom. What's the kingdom? What, what are you seeking when you seek the kingdom? When, when you seek the kingdom, what are you seeking? You're seeking God to be the Lord of your life. You're seeking the Lord to be the Lord. So a church on fire. You know, it's a seeking church. It's a church that's serious. You see, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness... What? Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. You've got to hunger for God. If you don't have a hunger for God, you need to ask God, Lord, I've been spoiling my appetite on something else. I've been having my appetite ruined on something else. I don't want to, I, Lord, I don't want those delicacies on, on that king's table. I want the delic delicacies on the king of kings table. Amen? So if you're not hungry for God, if you're not hungry for God, if you're not hungry for God, maybe you better take inventory. If you're not thirsting for righteousness, if you're not hungering for his word, 
If you're not, oh God, I want to I want to find your word and I want to eat it, Lord, because it's sweeter to me than the honeycomb. If that's not your story, where are you at? Not on fire, are you? But you want to be on fire. You want to be on fire. And you can. He says, those that seek me early will find me. Amen. I'll tell you what early is. Early is immediately, soon, right now. Turn, begin to seek him and praise him. I'll tell you the church of... That's on fire is a seeking church. The ch- a church on fire is a submitting church. I, I've, I've been doing some studying on that because I wanted to pull that scripture on Charlotte uh, out of Ephesians 5 where it says, Wives, submit to your husbands, you know. And then the Lord did some teaching, and I thought, Oh my, maybe I should have left that alone. <laughs> I'll tell you more about that later, okay? I will, I'll tell you more about that later. But it is a submitting church. It's, it's where you respect others. And you submit yourself to one another in godliness. You honor each other. Ah. Church on fire is a church that is filled with the Spirit. And I'll say this again. A church on fire. A church on fire is a church that is singing. A church on fire is a church that is seeking. A church on fire is a church that is submitting. And lastly, my thought for today is a church on fire is a church that is filled with the Spirit. Now, you all know that story because you go to Pentecostal church, you know. Um, Acts chapter 2, we make much of that. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all one accord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, filled the whole house where the city, and tongues of fire set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. Hmm. And I can picture that in my mind. It said, fire silhouetted, silhouetted them. Silhouetted them. You know, it wasn't like a, you know, when you, this tongues of fire, that's, that's our, our inadequate or inept way of trying to explain what took place. They were outlined in fire. There was something, there was something so vibrant, so anointed, so different about them that, I mean, it was like they glowed with God. You know, you see these, uh, por- these uh, artistic paintings, you know, from, from early on in church history, and you see where saints or religious leaders with their faces glowing, or there's even a halo around their head. You know why they painted that? Because it's true. When you have God on your life, there will be an illumination on you. You know, you ever, you ever looked at a pregnant woman and saw the pregnant woman's face glowed? Now, am I making that up or not? Well, listen, if you're pregnant with God's possibilities, don't you know that there's going to be fire on your house? Woo! Glory to God. And people can warm themselves in your presence. Now, somebody said, so I can't, I, can't, I can't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. I can't talk enough about the Holy Spirit. You see, the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit, I have some questions for you. Is the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit spiritual gifts? Don't get nervous on me. Is the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life spiritual gifts? No. No, because sometimes we can be very immature with our spiritual gifts, can't we? You know, gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You know, God gives you a spiritual gift. You know, you, you, you have to learn how to use that thing. It's like having a loaded pistol on the coffee table. You need to learn how to use that thing. <laughs> What's the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life? What did, say, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And who else? Your neighbors yourself. And somebody said, well, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor anyway? And Jesus straightened that out, didn't he? Yeah. How did Jesus say we would be recognized that we are Christians? What? By our love? Not by our demonstration of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are wonderful. You need to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. I earnestly desire spiritual gifts. 
I earnestly, God knows, I, right now, I want to tell him, I want to affirm this, him, Father God in heaven, I earnestly desire spiritual gifts. But even more than that, Lord, I want to have a heart of love like you have. Amen? Because that's most important. Now, I want to tell you, a church that is in, on fire will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I have a question for you. What is God? What? Why do you say that? That's what the Bible said. It's a good reason. 1 John 4, 8, God is what? God is love. So I said, Lord, teach Shard about this submission thing. <laughs> Very next verse says, husbands love your wives. And it didn't just say, it didn't just say husbands love your wives. He, he, didn't, he didn't just say husbands love your wives. I mean, I love her. I've been loving her since she was five years old. I even love her when I hate her. <laughs> now, if you've never been married, you don't know what I'm talking about. She loves me when she hates me, too. But then stop there. It doesn't say love your wives. It says love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. Love is an amazing thing. What is God? God is love. And what's the greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life? What is it, David? Love. Yes. Where's the, where's the scriptures for that? Where's that at? That's over in Galatians, is it? It's in um, Corinthians 13. Well, Corinthians 13, but the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, in Galatians. Galatians 6. What's 17, I think? But I want that 1 Corinthians 13 is where we're going to go. Because you've got to see what love, look, love, how many of you know, love, somebody said love's a little feeling gets around your heart, you know, just makes you, you can't quite, you can't scratch it, you know, you can't get to it, you know. How many of you think that's love? Is that love? That's emotion. That's emotion. Now, love can be very emotional in, in a lot of different ways. Somebody said this. Somebody said love is a verb. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 13, it says, it says, what is love? Now, we know what God is. God is love. So what is, what is love? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, uh, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become sounding brass or a charge, clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith, so I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing, nothing, Okay? And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Verse 4. What is love? What is love? Love is long-suffering, isn't it? It, it, it's not, it's not? It's not something that it does. It's something that it is. This is the way God loves. You understand? And to be filled with the Spirit... Jesus said the greatest commandment is love. So to be filled with the Spirit. Long suffering. And what else is love? Kind. Some of the, do you, you know this as well as I do. Sometimes Christians can be unkind. God has not called us to unkindness. Okay. Now, now here's some of the things that love does not do. We, we know what it is. It's, it suffers long, and it's kind. Here's some things it does not do. It does not envy. It does not parade itself or, you know, boast of itself. It's not puffed up. doesn't get an attitude like sometimes I do. It's not rude. It's not, it does not seek its own way. That's verse 5. And it's not easily provoked. But I want you to see this in verse 5. It thinks no evil. Now, there's another translation of that phrase. It thinks, love thinks no evil. There's another translation of that phrase. Anybody know what it is? Anybody know what another translation of that phrase is? Anybody know? Keeps no record of wrong. I want to ask you a question. Are you glad, are you glad God loves you like that? Are you glad that God doesn't bring it up to you what you did at another time in your life? 
Are you glad that God does not keep a record on you? Yeah. Keeps no record of wrong. What does love do? Okay, now listen, I'm, I'm closing. I'm in, this is my conclusion. I'm in the conclusion. A, a church on fire has to be a singing church. A church on fire has to be a seeking church. A church on fire has to be a submissive church. And a church on fire has to be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Maybe there's more to that. God is love. The greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in our life is the love of God. The greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in God. Isn't that amazing? The greatest evidence of the Holy Spirit in God is His love. For we who do not deserve His love. If you just love the people that deserve it, what's so great about that? Isn't that what the Pharisees and the publicans do? What's so great about If you just love the people that deserve to be loved, what's so great about that? I mean, is that any indication that the Holy Spirit is in your life? I'm thinking not. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> all right. So what does it do? It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And I'll tell you what love never does. Love never fails. You can try everything else. It'll fail. Your version of love might fail. But when you do it God's way, when you allow the Holy Spirit, oh, I, I want to, I, I, you know, I don't want to just preach about this. I don't want to just preach about this. I want to experience this. A church on fire is so much more than a shout. Now, there's a time to shout. I read over, over numbers said they shouted, said there was a shout of a king among them. Woo! When the king's there, it's time to shout. When the king's there, shout. But the king don't just go everywhere. The king goes where he's got loyal subjects. Lord, I seek your kingdom. When the king's there, when he's in residence, I can lift it high in the sky and let the whole world know. Amen? <laughs> you know, there's a time to shout. There is. There's a time to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And there's a time to be still and know that he's God. There's a, there's a time for the whole earth to keep silence before him. You know that? I want to know the difference, don't you? I want to shout when it's time to shout. And I want to humble my heart and hear when it's time to hear. Faith and hope and love will abide, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest proof of the Holy Spirit in our lives is loving others and especially loving your brothers and sisters. Now we love everybody. We're supposed to love everybody. 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 And we love people enough that we speak the truth in love. But who you are commanded to love is your brothers and sisters. How many know God didn't call us to be a judge? Wait a minute, there's only one judge. God did not call me to be a judge. He called me to be a witness. It's my job to witness. Leave the judging up to him. Just do the witnessing. Well, I'm glad we had a good time earlier. Because <laughs> I put you all to sleep. <laughs> God bless all of you. I love you very much. I've been privileged to serve here in my follow my dad's footsteps for a lot of years. Mom and dad laid a good foundation. Jesus is a foundation. Mom and dad laid a good foundation. I've been privileged to follow along behind them and be part of a team 
Thank you for letting me preach to you. Let's stand together.